The East African tradition of the Maasai tribe is to greet one another with the words Kasirian and Gera, which is Swahili for, so how are the children? In that community, the well-being of their children is the highest priority. If you are interested in participating in thought-provoking conversations about the well-being of children and families, please tune in every Wednesday at 3 p.m. to Fresh Start Today on A60 AM WNOV. Together, we can save our children. Good afternoon. You're listening to Fresh Start Today with your hosts, Jermaine Reed and Sean Roby. And we have our in-studio guest, um, Anne. She's going to be talking about a lot of interesting things as it relates to her life and her experience having been um, in foster care here in Wisconsin, and particularly in Milwaukee, right? Yes. All right. And then um, we have our um, guest mental health provider who is en route. She'll be pulling up momentarily. She might even be listening to this show, and she can call 414-444-5250 if she would like to join via the phone. But we're going to get the conversation started. There's a lot going on um, just locally and abroad. First of all, uh, this day in black history, let's start there, February 3rd, 1870. Some folks may not have been aware, but today in 1870, the 15th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was ratified, giving blacks the right to vote. Powerful. And it went into effect, save your voice, on March the 30th, on March the 30th. So hopefully um, those of us who um, have the right to vote, and that should be all of us by now, um, if we don't have a felony of some sort and on paper, we should be able to vote. But for those of us who are eligible um, and have a voice, we would strongly encourage you to get out and vote. And I believe um, Michael McGee Jr. has in, an initiative right now that's um, We Built the City. So um, that's encouraging folks to do the early voting, which began, what, April? No, sorry, February the 1st through February the 12th. Um, so just give, let me see, 286-3491 a call if you want more information. Make sure you get your IDs now. Um, young people who are in foster care, you're 18, you are eligible to vote. And hopefully, you know, there's some type of initiative or something or some candidates that are going out trying to work with the child welfare community and particularly with group homes and residential care centers just to inform that population of youth who are now eligible to vote to get involved in the political process um so so there's that and then we also have coming up may the 17th 2016 uh the color child welfare conference which is the only conference in the state that convenes to solely address the needs of minority children in foster care and i can tell you locally Minority children make up 80% of the foster care community, and of that 80%, African-American children make up 68.2%. I mean, every time I get in front of this microphone or somebody want to videotape me on something, I'm always going to talk about that 68.2%. That is a very important number for this community to be aware of. And let me say, before I... Um, finish talking about this conference with that 68.2 percent the thing that i want you to be mindful of is that that is representative of a number of different types of children you have children who were removed because of abuse and neglect you have children who were voluntarily removed or um, placed into care pro se who said basically for whatever reason i'm un not able to take care of my child and turn their children over to the state then you have those children who um I forget that third population of kids that I came up with, but um, those are those who live with some of their birth families. You know, um, you can be related to someone and have a foster care license and um, be placed in foster care. So just want folks to understand the population there that we're referencing when we say 68.2%. But we're having the Color Child Welfare Conference, and our celebrated theme this year is against all odds from foster care to success. Um, we are excited to have successful individuals who were once placed in foster care present at this conference. We have a judge, S. Pamela Gray, who was once in foster care. Now she's practically running uh, the foster care system in Washington, D.C. We have Dr. Stacy Patton, who is a celebrated author and journalist who was formerly in foster care and 
She's, she's also a university professor over at Morgan State. Then we have Senator Nakia Harris Dodd will be one of the uh, panelist guests. We have Dr. Jamie Schwant, Ophelia King, um, who was on the program a couple weeks ago, Dr. Mara Lewis, who will be our guest next week, um, Wendy Wright, who's a nurse. She was formerly in foster care. Then we have an author by the name of Brandy Nicole Brooks, who wrote a book called Black Mother, Single Mothers and Child Welfare. A very interesting book, and we're going to be giving some of those books away at the conference. Our very own um, uh, child welfare, this lady does everything, Wanda Montgomery. Then we have Senator Taylor will be on a panel dealing with mm-hmm. kinship care mm-hmm. and the president of the National Association of Black Social Workers will be presenting J. Tony Oliver. And if you want to get information about this conference and you may want to attend, um, you can go to hbsswceh.uwm.edu. My last announcement is... Um, that if you would like to provide foster care services, Fresh Start is one of very few um, black owned and operated foster care agencies in the state. Um, And there's other programs that do some great things, but um, I'm talking about Fresh Start right now. Fresh Start is a very good program (laughs) to be a part of. And uh, we really do care about the children. And if you would like to consider becoming a foster parent, you wanna learn more about the program, please call 414 351 1100 414-351-1100. So the Partnership Council was last week, June 29th, was hoping to see some of you all out there. You know, the thing that I'm concerned about for us as an African-American community, whether we're talking about politics or we're talking about child welfare, um, is that we have to engage in or at least be in the room. If we're not at the table, at least got to try to get into the room. And especially when there's an open public invitation for folks to come into the room. Because if you're not there, people will make decisions about your life, the lives of your children, um, folks that you care about, because you're not in the room and you're not at the table. But we have to, our activism has to move beyond liking things, statements on Facebook. And, yeah, you, you know, or calling into a show. We have to show up. And be present because if it if it doesn't matter to us, this sixty eight point two percent and what mm. and a large percentage of that population are children who were removed because of abuse and neglect. If we don't show up and if we don't care, certainly other folks are not going to care. So I encourage you all to uh, get connected, find out what's going on with the division Milwaukee Child Protective Services, which was formerly the Bureau of Milwaukee Child Welfare. So you know what I think. Um, that was that's enough of that <clears throat> announcement type stuff. We want to get into this conversation. Really do appreciate Anne coming into the show. Um, I met Anne a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to be talking about how safe is foster care. How safe is foster care? We know that the goal of child welfare in, in bureaus and departments across the country is to uh, promote the safety, well-being, and permanency of children. Those are the overarching goals for most bureau directors. I mean, bureau programs. Or, or department programs. And uh, we also know that when you go into the division, the Department of Milwaukee, De- Department of Children and Families website, you can see that their mission is listed, which says to improve the economic and social well being of children, Wisconsin children, youth, and families. The department is committed to protecting children and youth, strengthening families, and supporting communities. They have five overarching goals. One is that children are nurtured, safe, and engaged, enhanced prevention and early intervention efforts throughout Wisconsin. Families will have access to quality early care and education, and that parents will secure and maintain meaningful jobs. The last is that fathers will be more engaged in the lives of their children. So those are the five overarching goals, and out of the goal, the thing that st- stands out for me is the safety element. You know, children are nurtured, they're safe, and engaged. And that's something that every child should be, whether you're in foster care, you're not in foster care, children should be safe. Um, but there is national data out here, not saying that it's reflective of what's going on here in our community, but I imagine that there are some environments where children's care are is compromised and um, we're going to be talking about safety and child welfare today or safety and foster care how safe is foster care you can call 414-444-5250 so we're gonna 
talk about safety, but I want to introduce you all to someone. She's done some public speaking around the city, around the topic of human trafficking. Um, and so we do welcome her to this platform. There's a couple of things that we're hoping that our audience will be able to walk away with a better understanding of after this particular program. One is they understand the mission of the Department of Children and Families. Two, that we discuss about safety and children foster care. Three, that we'll define funding mechanism for foster care and adoptions. And then also that we understand what is the relationship between foster care and trafficking. Um, and so I think that you will be an excellent person really to help us with a couple of those pieces. So good afternoon, Ann. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming on the show. And the first thing I want you to do is introduce yourself, you know, who you are, your name, and just give us a little background information about yourself. Well, I am Ann, and I am 30 years old, and I have um, two sons in my, my custody and okay. one that is adopted out. And I am a public speaker, actually, in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, it's bigger than Milwaukee. Okay, well, th- well I'm sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> so I, um, I'm actually... You're going national. I, I'm actually the first person here in Wisconsin who ever spoke out against human sex trafficking and had enough courage to tell my story. Okay. And okay. so, and from there, I was introduced to um, public speaking. And... Um, and today, um, I want to give y'all a little background on my history. Okay. As far as with um, before the trafficking. Before, yeah, let's start from your childhood because before you were traffic, were trafficked or involved in trafficking, you were in foster care. Yes, so, I was in foster care. Okay. So, what was home life before you came into care? Um, chaotic. Um, my mom was on drugs. Um, my oldest brother was robbing people. Um, my oldest sister was a gangbanger. Um, my little sister and my little brother were um, under me a lot, and I took good care of them. I was like more of the mo- mother role for them. A parental, yeah. Yeah, parental so I had to yeah. get up in the morning, get them dressed, um, get them ready, out for school, and go to school. Okay. And um, we didn't have much food, really no food at all. And I remember the same thing that we used to eat. Um, we used to eat beans and oatmeal. And to this day, I would not eat it. Um, that's all we ate. Okay. was beans and oatmeal besides besides our school lunches. We would go to school and, and eat our school lunches, of course, and breakfast at school. Mm-hmm. But um, it was really um, lonely. It was okay. a really lonely childhood. And so that, at what age did you come into care? I'm um, seven years old. So for the first seven years of your life, you described that things were chaotic. And yeah, and I, can st- I still remember everything. Like, okay. I still remember everything like it's fresh. Okay. I like certain smells. I smell. I'd be like, oh, that's that smell from my childhood. I can remember that smell. Wow. Wow. Um, and so, yeah. You came into care. So what were the circumstances surrounding your coming into care? Uh, my oldest sister, she wrote a letter and put it in my book bag. But prior to that, um, that night before going to school, my um, little sister was getting um, beaten by my auntie. She wasn't a biological aunt. But she was um, someone that we always called auntie. And okay. she lived in the house with us. Okay, thick, thick, And um, my sister was so angry. My oldest sister, she was so angry and just so mad. And sh- she like, something got to happen. I guess that's what she was thinking in her head. But she had wrote the letter. And I'm not knowing what the letter said. I'm only seven years old. And when she put it in my book bag, she said, remember to get this letter to your teacher. And so um, I went to school the next day. And a whole day had went by, and I had forgot to get a letter to my teacher. And, okay. like, I'm going to my cubby to go get my book bag and get my coat. And I told my teacher, I said, um, oh, I forgot to give you this letter. Um, and I got the letter out of my book bag, and I gave it to her. And she told me, after reading the letter, she told me to go into the office. I cannot return home. And from there, um, I And you were up, seven at this point. I was seven years old. So you were in what, first grade, second grade? I was all, I was in first grade. You was in first grade, seven years old, and you have this letter that your sister wrote. And your sister said something on that letter that caused you to be removed from your family. Now, what some people may not know, um, and others will be familiar with this as we talk about this topic, but some children come into care because of domestic violence, others because of alcohol and other drug abuse issues, yes. um, abandonment, neglect, um, false allegation, racism is a factor, um, physical abuse, 
Yeah. And then we talked about before pro se people who voluntarily put their children into care. But in your sense, somebody wrote a letter and it was related to abuse that your sister had suffered and you were placed into care. Um, it was it was abuse that my little sister had suffered. It was abuse, so it wasn't even you. It, it, well, somebody we, in the, in a sibling group was physically abused. Yeah. By someone, and so were all of your brothers and sisters removed and placed together. What was no? Um, I got placed with my teacher, who I gave the letter to. Um, my little sister, and my little brother, ended up at my biological aunt's house. Okay. My oldest sister ended up at one of my biological aunt's house. I, to this day, I still don't think my oldest brother ended up in a foster care system because, like I said, he was out ripping and running, and so I don't think the foster care system had even caught up with him to even place him anywhere. Okay. Okay. And and so you were placed with your teacher. Now, how did that happen? Um, because because. I know our agency has licensed teachers, and actually I had some teachers call this week interested in becoming foster parents, but um, we've had some, some students, kids in our program who end up being placed with their teachers after they got licensed. So how did that happen? I'm not, you know what, I'm not sure. I ended up going home with her that same day um, after um, the social worker had um, met with me, and and at seven years old, like meeting with the social worker, the school social worker, and trying to figure out, like, what's going on, why I can't go home, scared. And I guess the safest place for me to go was my teacher's house. Okay. At what the was time. your relationship with your teacher prior to? I had a great of- relationship with my teacher. Okay. Okay. Um, great relationship with my teacher. Very great. Was your teacher aware of some of the living conditions that you were- I believe so, because it was certain things that she would do. Like, like um, she'd have a pair of socks, and I'll put on a clean pair of socks. Mm. Um She'll fi- um, fix my hair. She'll, like, wipe my face. Um, she asked me, am I okay? Do I, is there anything I need? And, you know, it was certain things that she knew um, what was going on, but she didn't report it um, either. But I ended up with her. Okay. And that's really important to really kind of highlight that, you know, to let folks know the role that teachers can play mm-hmm. in the lives of children who are oh, presenting yeah. with so many different type of conditions and issues that are going on in their lives. So that was great. What was it like living with your teacher? It was awkward. Um, mm-hmm. I loved my teacher. Don't get me wrong. I loved her. Okay. Um, but it but she had two twin daughters. She had a um a middle son who was a chubby middle son, and then she had the oldest son who who dressed in all black. So, hmm. and she was married. Okay. And and being in a biracial home, I felt different. Okay. And I remember after like a year of me being with her, I remember like writing a letter and I can remember it saying saying along these lines, saying that um I don't want to be here. I feel different. I like y'all, but I want to go home. Mm-hmm. And I just I, I just didn't feel right being there because they were you know they were a different race you know um even the food was different <laughs> like even though all I ate was oatmeal and beans it was so, it was like they cooking was different um they had a dog I didn't like dogs um I was always scared to come out the room cuz the dog running around um I just didn't feel comfortable there okay Okay. I wanted to go back to my family. You want to go back? And, you know, I, I think that is a feeling that most children in care have is that they want to go back home. They want to go back to their family. And and to be honest with you, about 70% of kids who come into care do return back home with family. So before we go any further, you know, I know in about three minutes we're going to take a break. Um, but but the question that I have for you is um, while you were placed, when, when you wrote this letter, to your teacher who is now your foster parent, you say, I like you all, but things are different for me, and I really would like to go home. Um, what happened after that point? She, um, she, I remember um, the social worker coming out, and I had a male um, African-American social worker. Okay. And he came out, and she gave the letter to him, and she um, told him that um, she think that, um, that, um, that I should be placed somewhere else, like more... Um, efficient for my needs okay okay um and i got placed somewhere else like a couple weeks later they ended up placing me somewhere else okay okay and so now you're in a new foster home yes and what was that placement like i liked being there okay but um i had um my one of my oldest foster brothers 
he would touch me and make me touch him. And I didn't like that. Okay. So that's interesting because that's when we're dealing with safety. And I was just in a partnership council meeting on last week, and they were talking about this legislation and, and the work that Wisconsin is doing around human trafficking, trying to counter that and provide safety and resources to young girls and boys or young men and young women who are caught up in the life or who may be at risk of getting involved in the life. And one of the things that I recall bringing up at this particular meeting is that I think there needs to be some effort to expand our focus to look at how do we create safety for all children who are in care right. um, on levels what we call one, two, and three, you know, um, in your general foster home setting, in your treatment foster home setting, of course, in group home settings, whether your congregate, set, congregate care settings, um, we really need to look at because there is a lot of sexual inappropriate behavior that actually goes on in foster care. And I think we, we owe it to children to address this issue appropriately and thoroughly. And so you were in the home, and to be honest with you, there is nothing that is unfamiliar about that piece right there. You know, um, that happens too often to children who are in care. And this is what we're talking about child to child sexual abuse or sexualized behavior. So you had this older foster brother who was adopted, right? Yep, he was adopted. By your foster mother. Yep. And this child, but there were other folks in this home environment, right? Yep. Okay, so how many other people were in there that was foster children? It was a upstairs and downstairs. Um, my oldest, one of my oldest foster sisters, she stayed downstairs. Mm -hmm. She was grown. She was like almost in her 30s. She had been um, with my foster mother since she was a baby. And she had a son, and they stayed downstairs. And upstairs, what um, I don't want to say his name, okay. but he stayed um, in the basement. His room was in the basement. It was a newly remodeled basement. His room was in the basement. And upstairs was me, um, me, and I share a room with two other foster sisters. My foster mother and one of my other foster sisters had her own room with her baby. Okay. So, so that's the dynamics, the layout. So okay. it's about six, seven of us in one house. You, you know, and, and so your foster sisters, because you were not the only one who was no. victimized no. in this particular home environment. No. Who else? My foster sister, who they considered retarded, um, which she did have some delays, mm -hmm. and he he touched her as well. And see, I think that's really interesting because, according, I'm gonna read you a couple statistics here. One is that the there was a study done by John Hopkins University that found that the rate of sexual abuse within the foster care system is more than four times as high as the general population, and in group home settings, the rate of sexual abuse is more than 28 times that of the general population. Um, another thing that was really interesting that I found was that children with disabilities are at higher risk of sexual abuse than children without disabilities. Right. And so when you think about that, I want, I want to talk about what was the response from your foster parents because you and this other foster sister were sexually perpetrated against and the response was different. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, the response, like, she would tell, and they'd say, oh, no, she just retarded. Don't listen to her. Until one day I had finally told them that he had touched me, too. Mm -hmm. And then that's when um, they ended up placing him outside of the home. And he was adopted. He had been with her since he was a baby. So I ain't no telling how many other foster kids that came in and out of there that he had did this to. So one thing I think is really important for folks who provide care or foster care is, is that having too many children with a variety of different issues sometimes present a safety risk or some other kind of risk, you know. Right. And then um, really having proper supervision is really important because how old was this young man, this foster sibling? He was 11. He was 11 and you were? I was 9. You know, so you were close in age. Yeah. Okay, so so that's not that's not too abnormal. But the fact is, he was adopted, and adoption just don't take away folks' issues. You, you know, they, you're adopted, and now you don't have PTSD. You're adopted, now you don't have ADHD. You're adopted, now you don't not have Everybody bipolar. was adopted. Even my, 
because I'm thinking about like their last names. All of them had the same last name except for me and one other um, foster sister. Okay. Um, meaning that she had adopted the one that they consider retarded. She had adopted my old. I had two older um, um, foster sisters that was adopted, um, and he was adopted. So she had adopted all of them, and it was just me and one other foster sister that wasn't adopted. Okay. So let, let me ask you this. Now, we want to talk a little bit before I go into this, talk about some preventive steps that far, that parents can take right. um, that will reduce the risk of children with disabilities particularly being victimized. Because depending on what type of disability you have, you can have, a, um, you can have autism, you can have something like... Um, what are the other type of disabilities? Intellectual and mental health disabilities. And and to be honest with you, most children who are in foster care, um, they have a label of some sort attached to them. Foster care is a label-driven industry. Mm. Some folks may not be aware of that, but that is just what it is. And so um, when we look at these different labels and, and, and conditions and delays and disabilities that most foster children are considered to be special needs children that sexual abuse is higher in that community i think we have to take preventive steps to try to reduce that let's let's just say um that many perpetrators of sexual abuse are known to their victim right that's just in general with any child population in 90 percent of cases children know who their sexual um perpetrator is yeah okay whether that's coach teachers parent siblings what they know they, right. there's a relationship there um we also know that based on what fbi has reported the fbi um, and the department of justice is that in 90 percent of these cases not only do they have relationship but in 90 percent of these cases sex offenders go under the radar which means you can do a battery of background screens or checks on the individual and guess what they will show up as clear there's nothing they're going to work in the daycare centers they're in the part of the churches they're in the schools right. a lot of this so that's that's a reality there um you know i think when you talk about steps um that educators and whatnot um can do for families is one particularly in the classrooms is have uh sexual education for those special education classrooms um and they may have to present it in a particular way but they still have to have those conversations but then another critical one for not only kids with special needs, but also kids in general is families need to have those dialogues with their children early and often about the body, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate touch. Because some people don't, because they think oh, they're delayed if they can't get it, they don't understand, right. you know, and right. maybe perhaps that, you know, those folks that was involved in your former foster sister's life that they didn't feel that she was cognitively, you know, right astute where she will be able to process and understand right. that she was being sexually violated or messed up with. Okay, uh, we have a caller on Fresh Start today. Um, that is Karima. Good afternoon, Karima. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You have a question well, or comment? I just wanted to comment as far as um, listening to the other caller and just the topic of today that I have, um, I'm, I have an open chips case with the Bureau and I just want to just mention as far as I'm kind of going with the same thing. Our parents um, and I have four children. One is in foster care, and right now she's going through with it. Um, just a lot of things that I'm not, I'm not happy with that's going on with her. Um, also, two of my two oldest sons, they were in group homes. There's a lot of things that was going on in the group homes too. And I just want to make a comment, you know, about that, and share my concerns. Okay. Well, appreciate you calling. So, what is your particular concern around um, safety? As far as, well, as far as safety, my two oldest sons, they were in group homes and they were getting, they were getting beat up. They were put in place somewhere where they were too young to be. And I kept addressing those concerns too, like the social workers. They were just getting physically attacked, not getting fed properly. But thank God, you know, that's resolved. Well, my daughter is still in foster care and it's still unresolved issues. Um, some of the safety issues, I would say, as far as, as my daughter, I'm not really 100% certain, but her behavior is is abnormal. She's afraid to go back to this lady's house. She's, you know, physically, um, she's crying. She's physically, on, you know, on edge. Um, I addressed this to the social workers, to the visitation ladies. They saw this as well. Things that I'm not as happy about as to where they've given her 
my only daughter, keep that in mind, giving her sleeping pills, permed her hair, giving her pork, which I don't agree with, um, taking her to medical appointments and having things done to her, you know, which I just don't approve of. But right now, the safety concern is she's not, I'm not certain what it is right now, but I just know that she cried, she's cried twice when she had to go back there. So my mind is just wondering, like, what is going on? Okay, and so have you spoken with the ongoing case manager? On yes. The case? Yeah. And what has your response been like with that individual? Um, to be, I, I, I spoke with her, and I asked her if she could investigate, and she hasn't got back with me. Okay, and how long has it been? I called her last week. I okay. spoke with her again this Monday. Um, we spoke to meet again Thursday. She wanted me to basically just put in writing what are my requests um, as far as how I want my daughter treated. But I feel that that's kind of something that should be like automatic. Treat her with care. Take care of her. She's very vulnerable right now being away from home. So, okay. All right. Well, I think you're on the right track. Um, we're, we're talking with the case manager, and, and I would agree. Put your concerns in writing because that's to protect you and and um, the other folks that are involved. So I, I would support that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks okay. Thanks a lot for tuning in to Fresh Start today. And, you know, regarding that last caller, I think um, <clears throat> what would be beneficial is for them to get the ongoing case manager's response in writing as well so they have that's their correct. own track record. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, so, so we're here, and we're going to take us a break, and then we're going to come back. And we're going to talk about the trafficking piece, your introduction to trafficking. Okay? Okay. All right. This is Jermaine reporting from Fresh Starts WBCM, Wisconsin Black Children Matter. Did you know that the number of black children in Milwaukee's foster care community continues to rise? According to the Department of Children and Families' most recent annual report, black children made up 68.2% of Milwaukee's foster kids. Many of these children are not only removed from their family and siblings, but are placed in families and communities that do not reflect or honor their race, culture, or heritage. Fresh Start is an agency that is committed to serving and advocating for black children. In order to meet the needs of this growing population, we need more black families in the Milwaukee area that love and celebrate black children. To become a licensed, culturally responsive foster parent with Fresh Start, you must be 21 years old, married or single with a stable income, clear several criminal background checks, and complete 36 hours of pre-licensing training. To learn more about other qualifications, call 414-351-1100. That's 414-351-1100. Again, this is Jermaine reporting from Fresh Start, WBCM, Wisconsin Black Children Matter. All right, you're listening to Fresh Start today with your host, Jermaine Reed and Sean Roby. We have in the studio with us Anne, and Anne is just sharing a little bit about her story. Um, we're talking about uh, how safe is foster care, and I uh, want to thank the caller who just called in. And So what we're talking about, you, you were placed initially at the age of seven with your teacher, and then you were placed in another foster home um, per your request, and uh, then at 12, you go back home. Yeah. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that majority of kids who come into care, uh, they do return back home. What was it like when you went back home? Um, awkward because it felt like I didn't know who my siblings was anymore. Like, Did you have visits with them while nope. you were in? You didn't have visits? Okay. No, nope. I didn't have visits with them. And I can say that the foster care system is doing a, a lot better job because you, you were in care some years ago. Yeah. You know, um, probably like 20, 20 years ago or 18 right. years ago, you were in care. Um, and I think they're doing a lot better job of, of, of making sure that siblings have contact and they're doing visits. Is right. there room for improvement? Which is great. All, which is great because that, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how important sibling relationships are. But you didn't know there was a disconnect. You really didn't yep. know who your siblings were, you know, kind of lost. They got big and they looked different. Okay. They got darker, you know. I was the, the only light-skinned one, but they done got black, real black on me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so, I don't, so, so, it was different. It felt awkward, you know, right. going back to, to a house that I really like. Were the conditions to, better? Yeah. Um, yeah, for a year and a half, two years, the conditions was good. Mom was doing what she's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, staying in her ALDA treatment programs and, you know, she did what she was supposed to do after for two years. Okay. And then she resorted right back to the old people, places and things. And then what happened as a result of that? How did um, that impact she ended your life? Up, um, she ended up back on drugs, and now I'm back taking care of my little sister, my little brother. And now I'm a freshman at North Division High School, okay. going to school, vulnerable, 
don't know who to talk to, just went to school, did my work, come home, take care of my little sisters and my little brother. And that's what I did. And so at that point, at some point, you get involved in sex trafficking. Yes. Well, I used to sit on my porch and I read a lot of books. Because I was going to ask you, how is it that kids can be at home? Because we know that, according to FBI, FBI data, is that um, in 2013, 60% I'm sorry, 67% of the young people reported missing and likely trafficked were in the care of social services or foster care at that particular time. And let me, re- let me restate that. That was 2012. And that's according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We also know that there was a raid in 2013 where, 70, well, uh, where they did a raid of 70 cities and 60 out of the 100 children who were recovered were in foster care. So how is it that children or young ladies, young boys are being traffic it while in the care of their parents well my well in my household it was like this one rule you was you were okay as long as you were out the way you know so what, what's that rule again it, you were okay as long as you was out the way meaning that wow, like I got as you. long as i stayed maneuvered around her while she was getting high and you doing her little thing i was okay to do whatever it is that i needed right. for, for me to do which and that was survive, that 12 like yeah. sneak in the refrigerator to get what i want you know Maybe sneak a couple dollars, you know, go to the store. I was okay as long as I stayed out the way. Okay. And that's how it was. Okay. And so as a result of that, you're out on the porch, you say. I used to read a lot of books. I was a very, very smart kid. Okay. Um, Sat on my porch and did almost everything. Read books, did homework. Um, And it was a guy from the neighborhood um, that I lived in. Um. And he will always ride past, bumping his music, you know, and I, you know, my nod my head, snap my fingers, you know, to his music. And he looked it good, riding past a little good that I could see. And um, and one day he stopped in front of our, in front of my house. And when he stopped in front of my house, it was like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? I never talked to a boy before. Mm-hmm. Um, how I, old were you? No. I was fourteen. You were fourteen now. Okay. Yep. And how old was he? He was 18. He was 18 years old. I was 14. Okay. Um, and he looked good. He got out the car, and he act, he started asking me a lot of questions like, what you reading? You always reading books on your porch. So um, he had been watching you for a while? Yeah. Okay. And that's a sense of acknowledgement. So like when I, yeah, validation. Yep. Attention. Yep. yep. Okay. Which every child wants attention. Right. You know, so it's really important that parents pay attention. And you know what? You don't have to pass a law to pay attention to your kids. Nope. We don't need 5,000 signatures. We don't even have to do a march on Washington or right. watch a march on Milwaukee or march on uh, Wisconsin. Right. Folks can pay attention. It won't cost you any more money to pay right. attention to your kid. So he paid attention to you. Yeah, and then he got to know me. Like, he would take me to school and... Drop me off at school. He would buy me nice stuff. Did your mother stuff. know him? Um, My mama knew him. And that's something because um, I was reading something talking about one of the tactics and strategies of some uh, pimps and, and they don't call them pimps anymore. What do they call them? Traffickers. What traffickers. traffickers or something else? They got another name. I don't know the other players. Name. They call it pimp players and hustlers back in the day. So I don't know. traffickers. But then even in that same line, you have <laughs> even in that same line, you have sex offenders. Well, yeah, but across that board, it's that grooming process where, in most instances, somebody just doesn't go out and grab somebody. It's that it takes time. And they build trust, it's trust. and rapport, not only right. with that child or that victim, but also with that individual's parents. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah, everybody thinks the snatch and grab, I'm going to throw her in the van and I'm going to take her across, the, um, that's only in the, across the seas. Right. right. And so, that's not realistic. No, but it's happening right here. Yes. It's a process. And it's happening on folks' front porches, on their back porches, in right. their alleys, in their homes. And parents are talking to individuals who are grooming their children to right. use them as sexual objects for their pleasure. Um, that's really deep. Um, so you're 14. You get involved with this guy. And my question for you is this. Do you think it was a good decision or choice for you to go back home? If you would have stayed in false care, do you think, I, I know there's a large percentage of the kids who are rescued from trafficking that they come from false care community, but do you think that you would have ended up in trafficking? No. One part of me, like, when I was in foster care, like, my foster parent was awesome. I had, like, the best foster parent. And there's some great foster parents um, She was awesome. She took very good care of us. We went on vacations. And, 
and I loved her, and I still have a relationship with her to this day. Mm-hmm. And I don't think <sighs> one part of me wanted to go home because of my little sister and my little brother, and my you know my siblings. They were all see. back at home. Um, I don't even know if we all. I think I came home first. Okay. If I can remember, I came home first, and then my little sister and my little brother came. Okay. And my oldest sister, she came, but she it was like she wasn't really at home anyway. She was almost 18 years mm-hmm. old. So she, it wasn't like she was always there anyway. And then, my, like I said, my oldest brother was out doing his own thing anyway. Um, and I don't think, I think that I would have wanted to stay. You, if you had a choice, you would have wanted to stay with your foster mother. Yeah. First of all. Okay. So so are there situation and conditions where in your opinion, having been you know, been in this situation for are there situations where you just think it's not good for kids to go back home? Yeah. In some instances, yeah. Um, I would think that that there should be like a follow up, like once the kids get placed back home. Because <laughs> It's so easy for people to resort back to what they used to. Mm-hmm. And for my mom, it was getting high and right. having fun and kicking it in and not being responsible. So you go back home. Yeah. And you're back home for two years. And then you, at 14, you're trafficking now. And then at 17, right? Yeah. Is when you're trying to get out of that life. Yeah, I finally ran to, I finally got away. Um, was it the same pimp player, hustler, yep, whatever he was? Same it was guy. The same guy. I was okay. with him. For, I was traveling from fourteen to seventeen years old. Um, I finally got away um, in Oshkosh when we ended up in Oshkosh. I finally got away, and let's like we winded a little bit because um, while I was trafficked, I also had a baby. They got sent back to Milwaukee um, to be back home with my mom. And, yeah, that's how I ended up with my son that's in foster care. They ended up in foster care. Okay. Um, because when I got pregnant, my baby got sent back to Milwaukee. And okay. so it's like now I'm really feeling obligated. Like I really have to be here and really make this money for him. Um, I felt obligated. Like I had to do it now. Like there's no. Um, because you have a baby by him. Is that what you're saying? No. The okay. baby wasn't by him. I'll say I wouldn't. Well, That's because, a whole she has a baby. because she has a baby, and you want to get back main... to yeah. your baby. You have to do something to provide for your child. No, I had to like make sure he don't like kill my baby. So I had to make sure I keep giving him, keep doing what he wanted me to do, and I be see. compliant. I and see. I think with I that see. right there, a lot of people don't realize it's a power and control component that's associated with trafficking. Um, sex offenders, that grooming process, it's the power of manipulation. So all of those things are critical. Uh, and important to keep in mind for all children. So now you have a different reason for doing the trafficking because now you want to protect your child. Yeah, right, it's okay. like now because so, at first I wasn't as compliant as you can. I, I got my head buzzed. Mm-hmm. Like let's jump them. We can all jump them because it wasn't just me. It was other girls with me. I understand. And I was the one who would say, "Well, let's just jump them. You know, let's just get them, and we can we can all get away." Right. And they would tell on me. Now, these are girls that came from really nice homes with the mother and the father with the white picket fence, and mm. they decided at 13, 12 years so, old, they want to run away. So it's not just and, poor see, folks that's no. being trafficked. It's not just black folks that's I being was the trafficked. only black girl that he had. So let's get see. this straight. All right. Now, if you want to join this conversation, you can call 414-444-5250. So you, you want to get out at some point. You have a child. The child is placed with your mom, but then the child ends up in foster care. Yep. I found out when I when I met, returned back to Milwaukee, uh, my mother had moved. And when I ended up catching back up with my mom, they saying that my, my oldest sister had already said, well, your son ended up in a foster care system. So my first thing was that my sister was staying on 15th and North Avenue. And now there was a child brew welfare office right there on North right Avenue. Right 17th. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And excuse me, I had went right back. I had went right to the one on North Avenue. Mm-hmm. And I had told the lady, I had ended up meeting with the social worker who uh, was over the case. And and I had told her everything that had happened. Okay. And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? Like, this is not going on. That couldn't have happened. Um, 
you just didn't care or you were careless. And um, the court date ended up coming up. I ended up being able to go to court. So okay. I'm like dressed up. I'm looking nice. You know, I, I'm like, OK, I'm in front of this judge. Right. And now um, I have to get on the stand and tell them what's going on. Your situation. Your s- yes. I got on the stand. And I told them everything that had happened. And, and they didn't the believe me. And they didn't believe So you're talking about the judge, they, the judicial folks, the Nobody folks believed me. And the only thing that they can say to me at 17 years old was that you are too young to care for a child. That you're That's too young. Where was your child placed? Me. He was placed in foster care in an all-white um, family. Did that family adopt him? Yes. Do you think that sometimes in foster care and as it relates to adoption that there are some unnecessary removals and or adoptions? Yes. Yes. Like I didn't even get the chance to like be with him or know him or to tell him and and, and he's 14 years old now. And so How how did that adoption impact you? I ended up on drugs. So in some way, did you become your mother? Yep, and I told myself I'd never be like my mama. I told myself many days, i never be like you. I hate you. And I ended up just like her. On drugs, a baby in foster care, and that's adopted. And I and I and when I sat back and I thought about it, I said, well, my mom did a little better than me. She did get us back, and when I tried to get my son back, I just felt like a failure. I felt like the system had failed me. I didn't want to trust nobody. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to tell nobody because if did nobody believe me what was going on, my mom had known what had happened. My sisters, they had known. My little brother, everybody had known what had happened to me. And there was nobody to, like, stand up and fight for me. Nobody. Nobody. Not a case manager. Not a case manager, not a social worker. Not nothing. Your guardian, line, your attorney, or nobody. They looked at me like this was foreign. Because probably back, I wasn't. I wasn't years reported. They in. I wasn't reported missing either. So by me not reporting, being reported missing, um, and that starts. With they the felt like. And see, that's something that really law enforcement has to work on because just at this partnership council meeting last Friday, there was a representative from, I don't know if it's the Department of Justice or what division of law enforcement, branch of law enforcement, but they were talking about the human trafficking piece and what the police response typically is, um, particularly as it relates to older youth. And my whole thing is that, you know, if, if children are like over the age of 11 or whatever is 11, 12 years old, the way law enforcement look like look at it is like, okay, well, you know, um, this is not a critical search. It's not a priority issue, but failing to understand that those first couple hours of a teenage girl who is, what, 13 years of age and over is very critical, that, you, you, you know? Yeah, you know, you think about, you can, like, think about, like, as far as with, like, how it is now, like, if a, if a kid don't go to school, the mother go to jail, they got that now. Right. Like, like here in Milwaukee. I like, ain't if seen the that happen. She if the about kids don't after, go to school, so the truancy. mother can go to jail for it. And well, back yeah. then, that they didn't have that. When I when I was like, they got like they got that in place where like, and if fine. I did come to school, she you know then she had no choice but to report me missing. If that was the case, but if that would have had that back then, they have that in place now. Like and, if the kids don't go to school, right. the parents can go to jail. And that speaks to what, the what, cross what connections of. What um, advice do you have for these social workers and case managers who are working with young ladies who – there are some young ladies today that's in your situation, be it in foster care or their child is in the system. What is your advice to them? What is it you need for them to know and understand? For the um, for the social worker who the is case, – yeah. For the case manager or the social worker who is supposed and to be judge, helping. All them folks. Helping the um, – who's supposed to be helping the mother – um, be reunited with their <coughs> child. I think that they need to be able to listen um, to what they're saying, because um, the mother does know what she's talking about. Like, did nobody believe anything that I said? Um, and I just really believe, like, if they um, they communicate a little better and and not st- not look at a person temporary situation right. and really try to help some these these ladies or men who are who trying to get their kids back help them set goals and to help them achieve them 
um, instead of saying, well, this is what I need you to do in order for you to get, help them achieve some of those goals. Some people, some people are not really trying to get their kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a true statement, right? There are some you folks, know? whether we want to accept and believe that or not, who are not trying to get their kids And there back. are some people who are not, but at least try to take the chance on um, being what a social worker really supposed to be doing, um, providing services. Okay. And, and, you know, I think one key thing to add to that is whether it's a, a foster parent, a teacher, a case manager, people need to always remember that if a kid brings to you the whole, they make mention of being sexually abused, somebody needs to take that seriously. Because sometimes, yes, men lie, women lie, kids lie, but. But in less than 1% of cases. There you go children actually lie about being sexual abuse. So you have to right. believe children when they speak. And, and that's why you have to do that due diligence and investigate that anytime that's being shared with by a kid. Right. But in, in your case, what, what you're talking about right now, and is, you know, being believed, having a voice, um, <coughs> and, and just getting the type of support that... That I needed. That you needed. And that caused you to spiral... Yep. into a place that probably was a very dark place. Oh, yeah. It was pitch black, dark. I couldn't see. But, you know, I often, but I often wonder when we talk about um, adoption, unnecessary removals and adoptions, I want to read something that uh, Secretary Wade F. Horn uh, testified before the Subcommittee on Human Resources Committee on the Ways and Means, U.S. House of Representatives in June 2003 where he gave uh yeah 2003 where he gave a he presented the president's proposal for improving child welfare and i want to kind of talk about the financial piece of this title 4e is the funding or the dollars that are used to pay for foster care and adoptions okay this is what he said a state that is successful in preventing unnecessary removals or in shortening lengths of foster care stays actually is apt to receiving less federal funding than a state where children remain in foster care for a long period of time. Thus, states tend to overuse foster care because they receive federal matching funds for every qualifying child in care. So we've often talked about it on this program and other publications that, that foster care and adoption is big business. It's big money in that. And it's not so much about the foster parents who are making a whole lot of money. Right. They ain't build no, they, you know, they ain't buying no mansions with these little checks that they're giving folk. Um, but there's some other folk, pharmaceuticals, behavioral health specialists, mentoring agency, just a number of folk, executive administrators, or chief administrators, and a lot of folk who run child welfare that's making some hefty dollars off foster care. So when we look at this and we look at, the number of children who are in care. And I want to give an example of something as it relates to this uh, Title IV-E adoption incentive program that was instituted. Um, what it's done is it, it, that it's helped increase adoptions since the Adoption Safe Family Act. And we've talked about that Adoption Safe Family Act on this program a number of times. It gives states a financial bonus for each child adopted out of the foster care above a baseline. In 1997, just 31,000 children were adopted out of foster care. Within a few years of the program's implementation, that number rose to over 50,000 per year, mm -hmm. exceeding 55,000 in 2009. Congress has since increased the bonuses to states for adoption of older children and children with special needs. So when we look about, about this incentive, in this environment, let's just say your kid was placed in my home, and that kid, you know, um, it could be two weeks, three weeks, a kid is placed in my home. I don't know this kid from any other kid. And first thing they want to know is, are you an adoptive resource? And I don't know what the climate was then when you had your son in care 15 years ago. And I, I can remember that climate. Yeah, I can remember that climate um, because I was asked 15 years ago if I would adopt this little boy. I ain't going to call his name, but I've been in this for 16 years. So I often wonder if we are overusing foster care when it's not necessary. Right. Okay. Jeff, you're on Fresh Start today. You have about 30 seconds. I'm sorry. We're about to close this segment. Jeff, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, I'm a retired uh, casework manager. Yes. And 
I listened to what the young lady was saying back then, 15 years ago. You had a lot of European American uh, caseworkers that were from predominantly rich neighborhoods, or you know, that got into the field that had no respect for minority children or their families or the parents. So they would do whatever they thought was right, which was wrong, because mm. they were trying to get rid of them. The, the, the quicker the quicker they could get rid of them, the lower their caseloads would be, and they would sit there and say, well, I, I placed this mm. child with this other family. and But they were young European-American caseworkers. And I mean, I've noticed it even today. A lot of the ones that come out of uh, rich neighborhoods or areas where there's very few minorities, they don't know what to do with them. So they do whatever they think is right, even though it's wrong, but they get rid of them as quick as they can, regardless of the circumstances. And you know what, Jeff? I I appreciate you calling. I appreciate your observation and being someone who worked in the system. But I also think a little of that still goes on today, to be honest. Oh, it is. It's still going on. I see it every day. Wow. Well, you know what? Our time has come to an end, but it was great having you listen to the program, Jeff. Hope you'll continue to listen. And we'll be back on next week on Fresh Start Today. Thanks, Ann, for coming in. And and be well. Be safe. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care.